Good evening, everyone. I am Nilamri Pirmal. I am an LLM student at the Center for Postgraduate Legal Studies, Jindal Global Law School. On behalf of the OP Jindal Global University and Law Schools Global League, I welcome you all to the International Conference on Combating Corruption in Law and Practice Comparative Perspectives, convened on the occasion of the International Anti-Corruption Day, which is on 9th December. First and foremost, I sincerely thank you all for your presence on a Sunday evening. As a part of the program, we begin our proceedings with the inaugural session on comparative perspectives on prevention, criminalization, and asset recovery. We are honored to have with us this evening representatives from the United Nations Office of Drugs and Crime, embassies of Brazil, China, Bhutan Anti-Corruption Commission, Asian African League Consultative Committee, and professors from China University of Political Science and Law and FGV Law School, Brazil, who are members of the Law School's Global League. May I now request Professor Raj Kumar, Vice Chancellor, JGU, to deliver the welcome address. Good evening to all of you. Uh, it is indeed my proud privilege uh, on behalf of OP Jindal Global University, uh, Jindal Global Law School, the Center for Postgraduate Legal Studies, and the Jindal School of Government and Public Policy, also the Law School's Global League, our partner in this endeavor, to welcome all of you to this um, International Anti-Corruption Day Conference on Combating Corruption in Law and Practice, Comparative Perspectives. Uh, I also want to take this uh, moment to welcome our distinguished um, participants as well as speakers in today's conference. Uh, I recognize the presence of Mrs. Sergei Kapinas, representative for the South Asian region of the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime, the Regional Office for South Asia, uh, Ms. Wang Liu, Deputy Secretary General of the Asian African Legal Consultative Organization and Counselor, Foreign Ministry of China, Beijing, um, China, Mr. Gustavo Di Kuna Westman, Head of Domestic Policy and Social Affairs, Embassy of Brazil to India. Uh, Ms. Dusho Netin Sangmo, former chairperson, Bhutan Anti-Corruption Commission, Timpu Bhutan. Professor Guo Shiwan, Professor of Law, uh, our partner university, China University of Political Science and Law. Uh, and Professor Paulo uh, Aruja, Professor of Law from another partner law school, uh, FTV in Brazil. I also want to recognize the presence of uh, Mr. Malhotra, the former distinguished uh, law secretary of the government of India, and all other distinguished uh, individuals, uh, our students of the LLM program, our alumni of the LLM program, other participants, speakers in various sessions, including the conference that we will have on campus tomorrow. Uh, indeed, uh, this conference and this workshop is organized at a very important time when issues surrounding corruption um, and, and the role of law in fighting corruption as is not only confronted many uh, institutions as well as uh, democracies, but also in other societies as well. Uh, in fact, uh, in the Indian context, the fight against corruption has been a very long and arduous journey. For those of you who may not be familiar with the growth and evolution of uh, anti-corruption efforts in India, uh, in India, the right to information legislation, the establishment of the Central Information Commission, and the uh, civil society galvanization of social consciousness surrounding the fight against corruption is a very important uh, aspect uh, in the fight against corruption. Uh, of course, uh, the one of the one of the most challenging parts of the fight against corruption is the need for building. Uh, democratic institutions and empowering these institutions in the fight against corruption. Uh, for those of us who are lawyers in the room, we place enormous emphasis uh, in law and, uh, and how law as a uh, social instrument can help in the fight against corruption. But we also know that there are significant limitations in law uh, and, and, and despite the fact that the legal and regulatory framework of many countries does prohibit corruption in all its forms and manifestations, corruption continues to be a major challenge. Uh, this is true in the case of democracies such as India, but also it is also true for older democracies such as the United States, as it is grappling today, uh, including uh, its uh, own president uh, dealing 
fundamentally dealing with issues surrounding corruption and abuse of power. Uh, of course, uh, one of the remarkable uh, aspects of the problem of corruption is the fact that one cannot assume that a particular form of government uh, you know, immediately provides uh, a better uh, framework for uh, resolving the problem of corruption for those of us who live in democracies uh, and, uh, and governments which are based upon democratic forms of government. We've always believed that democracy is one of the powerful antidotes to corruption, and I continue to believe so. But when you start looking at uh, uh, you know, uh, the Transparency International, and I always tell my students about um, when, when we look at the TI rankings and when you look at countries which are faring in the Corruption Perception Index, um, I, I tell both my Chinese and Indian students that uh, China and India uh, fare very poorly uh, in the uh, Transparency International uh, uh, International's, uh, CPI. Uh, in the sense that I do strongly believe that there are high levels of corruption in both China and India. Uh, nevertheless, uh, it has different forms of government. So then the question is, uh, we need to really figure out more deeply and try to answer in a more nuanced manner that how do we uh, you know, prepare ourselves to fight corruption, to what extent law and legal institutions can help in the fight against corruption, to what extent transparency and uh, implements or other instruments such as the right to information can help in the fight against corruption, and more importantly, how do we build uh, independent institutions in the evolution of the fight against corruption. Uh, many years ago, before I moved to India, I used to work in Hong Kong for many years, and I had the privilege to work very closely uh, with the uh, with, with Hong Kong's Independent Commission Against Corruption. And as uh, some of you know in this room, that uh, the ICAC in Hong Kong is one of the remarkable uh, you know, and more effective institutions that has uh, enabled the fight against corruption. And I have written extensively on that, including a book, uh, in which I've argued about the history and evolution of the Hong Kong's Independent Commission Against Corruption. But uh, listen, uh, Hong Kong was not always so. Uh, in fact, a few decades ago, uh, levels of corruption in Hong Kong was extremely high. And uh, many of the problems that Hong Kong as a society had to face in relation to corruption was similar to what China and India and other countries, including the developing and developed countries in the world, do face. Uh, but a very systematic approach towards the fight against corruption, including building an institution such as the ICAC, uh, creating a civil society uh, participation, and also building awareness surrounding the fight against corruption and enabling uh, individuals and citizens to participate in the fight against corruption was the success of Hong Kong's ICAC. Uh, there have been efforts and similar models that have been attempted in other parts of the world with varying degrees of effectiveness. Nevertheless, uh, I think it's, it's, it's a cause that is worthy uh, to uh, you know, uh, support. And now, of course, the reason uh, this cause is worthy to support even today is the fact that uh, people have enormous faith uh, on the uh, people who are exercising power and those who are exercising power have a responsibility and duty to ensure that uh, they adhere to the rule of law. In some ways, the fight against corruption is also our effort to uphold the rule of law. And upholding the rule of law and in that process uh, ensuring a, a certain degree of access to justice is the heart of the fight against corruption. It is not so much about, um, you know, it's also about uh, ensuring that the governance mechanisms are effective and are fulfilling the promise that uh, has been made by the people, by the people who are governing uh, to the uh, people uh, in every society. But more than that, it's also about ensuring that the aspirations of people are adequately met in the fight against corruption, and that is also part of this effort. I'm very delighted that the Law Schools Global League, a very distinguished organization which brings together law schools from around the world, has uh, you know, enabled the organization of this uh, particular workshop. Uh, and also I'm grateful to all the speakers, uh, particularly from the uh, countries in the BRICS region, to have come together the challenges and problems that we face together uh, in, uh, in, in, in parts of these countries are quite different and unique. And in some ways, we need to address them with this shared experiences from our region. I'm very grateful to all of you for taking out your Sunday afternoon and evening to join us in the 
first day of this conference. Tomorrow we will be uh, moving into our campus where we will continue the proceedings of this conference. So with those few words, uh, I would like to once again extend a warm welcome to all of you for this conference. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Rajkumar. Uh, may I now request Professor Mohan Kumar, Vice Dean Jindal School of International Affairs, for his introductory remarks. Thank you very much. Uh, founding Vice Chancellor of uh, Jindal Global University, Professor Raj Kumar, uh, Registrar of the Jindal Global University, Professor <coughs> Murthy, uh, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I will not take too much of your time. I'll try to take off from where Professor Raj Kumar left, which is always a difficult task and a tall order. But uh, when I joined the Foreign Service, one of the reasons was that I was wanting to run away from politics. So that's one of the normal reasons why people join the Foreign Service. If you don't, you know, you get high enough rank to join the Foreign Service, but you don't join the Administrative Service in India because you get caught in politics. And we, foreign, the Foreign Service, always tell the IAs that we are more honest people. The response to that from the IAs, and I'm being free frank because I'm now retired, I'm a free man. The IAs people always tell us, your morality is lack of opportunity. That is why you are honest. So I would like all of you to think about that as well. But I completely agree with Professor Rajkumar. I've spent 36 years outside India. Corruption seems to have no correlation with the kind of government authoritarian, illiberal democracy. It doesn't seem to have any correlation with the level of economic development. That's the second point I want to make. And we can give you tons of examples of countries which are a lot richer than India, where there is corruption. The only thing that is said about India, which annoys people, is lower level corruption. Because we don't pay our, maybe our traffic policemen enough. That is very annoying. But other than that, it's not as if the level of economic development, it doesn't seem to change anything. And the third more important thing I would say is also the salaries. I mean, when I joined the Foreign Service, the salary was 780 rupees a month. Okay, 780 rupees a month. For those of you who don't know rupees, that was about $10, present rate of course. So our salaries have now gone by, grown by leaps and bounds, but it hasn't changed anything. How do you explain that? Because the Singaporean model is very simple. The Singaporean ambassador's salary is linked to the CEO of Citibank in every place where he is posted. How I wish I belonged to the Singapore Diplomatic <laughs> Service, right? So everywhere, uh, if, you are, if, if he's the Singapore ambassador in Beijing, he gets exactly the same salary as the CEO of Citibank. Lee Kuan Yew's view was, if you pay peanuts, you will get monkeys to work for you. So you pay them well. Now, Singapore is able to enforce it because I remember a colleague of mine in Geneva who will remain unnamed, he made a small error in claiming um, taxi charges which he had not spent and they actually suspended him. Singapore is very, very particular about this. They say we pay you enough, you have no reason to be corrupt. But that doesn't seem to have worked in India where actually the civil servants' wages have gone up exponentially. I cannot believe uh, that, you know, the, the pensions and the salaries we get today because this is not what was the case, let's say, 30 years ago. So that doesn't seem to change much either. And finally, finally, there is also this issue that you go across continents and you find that human nature is vile at the end of the day. So corruption, I think, is not about law because every country will, have, will tell you that we have the law. It's about enforceability. It is more also about, I mean, how do you explain Nordic countries where you know that corruption is virtually zero? It's a fact. How do you explain that? And that has got nothing to do really with the average income or anything because countries which are as rich, and I don't want to talk about the Gulf because that would be politically incorrect, but there are some countries in the Gulf which are as rich as the Nordic countries, but where we know the levels of corruption are different. So I just want to leave you with this thought that this is, I think, probably and arguably the most complex phenomenon when it comes to governance. There is no discernible link with anything other than just three observations, if you like. One, I think human nature is wild. Two, where there is an opportunity to do something, people seem to take advantage. And thirdly, if you cannot 
enforce a law without any discrimination, you're going to continue to have corruption. I think the key is not having a law. Everybody has a law. Can you enforce it completely on the basis of non-discrimination, regardless of the stature of the person in the country, whether it's the prime minister or it's just a traffic constable, you should be able to haul up the person and put him behind bars. Can you do it? In a country like India, it's very, very difficult. But even in smaller countries, that's something which is very tough to do. So with those thoughts, thank you once again. I think it's a wonderful, timely initiative. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Mohan Kumar. Uh, I now request uh, Mr. Sergi Capinos, uh, Ms. Wang Liu, Mr. Gustavo Westman, Ms. Nitin Zangmo, Professor Guo Zioan, and Professor Paolo Arauzo to please take the seat in the front. Thank you very much. Uh, I now request Mr. Sergei Kapinos, representative for South Asia, United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime, Regional Office for South Asia, to deliver his special address. Sir, please. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, let me introduce myself. I am uh, the regional representative of uh, the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime. And previously, uh, for a long time, I served as ambassador of the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. Uh, this organization has uh, three dimensions of security, and uh, corruption uh, is under its second and third dimensions of security. These are and uh, this may give you a clue to understanding uh, the nature of corruption and how to um, mitigate or combat uh, this uh, phenomenon. So this is under the second, that is economic and environmental. So it, it deals with uh, management, governance, and uh, well, economic factors. And the third uh, uh, dimension is a human dimension. Uh, this is about uh, rule of law, rights, human rights and uh, democratic uh, development. So in uh, this capacity, I had uh, extended experience in addressing issues of uh, corruption and uh, I'll try to share my experience uh, uh, in my presentation, but later on, if uh, you have questions, I'll be glad uh, to answer them. So first of all, uh, on behalf of the uh, UN Office on Drugs and Crime, uh, I'd like to express my uh, great privilege uh, to be a part of this very important uh, conference. I'm most grateful uh, to the organizers of uh, uh, this event, uh, OP Jindal Global University, for inviting us and uh, commend uh, the university and the law school Global League for organizing it. So, and uh, this is really remarkable because uh, we are celebrating the 15th anniversary of the landmark UN Convention Against Corruption. UNODC is a custodian of this convention and uh, it is proud that uh, today 186 uh, countries in the world have signed and ratified this convention, including uh, the countries of South Asia. Uh, the UNCAC, as we call it, is the only universal legally binding anti-corruption instrument and the globally accepted framework for action uh, by member states. And this is a unique uh, document where uh, there is a comprehensive uh, identification of uh, corruption, 
So this is uh, real unique uh, in terms of uh, identifying uh, the ramifications and impact and uh, the nature of corruption. And uh, all the countries uh, who ratified uh, this uh, document are supposed uh, not only to ratify, but uh, to bring their national legislation in line with the provisions uh, of this international legal instrument. Well, uh, not many, and I'd like to emphasize, have done it successfully. So uh, this is a challenge, and uh, this is uh, well a long way, and uh, it depends uh, on uh, the well political will, on the level of uh, socio-economic, political development of uh, any country. But uh, in a nutshell, it will take uh, time uh, because uh, because uh, corruption, as was mentioned, is a very complex phenomenon, and uh, uh, no easy solution uh, can be found uh, to cope with it. UNCAC seeks uh, to counter the economically damaging effects of corruption by requiring member states uh, uh, to implement measures in a broad range of areas, like bribery, embezzlement, abuse of functions, illicit enrichment, even political corruption, with a particular focus on uh, reinforcing key rule of law institutions through strengthening transparency, accountability, and integrity. Today, so we are discussing uh, uh, the direct and uh, indirect uh, effects of uh, corruption. And uh, uh, I'd like to quote uh, the Secretary General of UN, who uh, made a special uh, presentation on uh, the International Anti-Corruption Day. Corruption robs societies uh, of schools, hospitals, and other vital services, uh, drives away foreign investments, and uh, strips the nations of their natural resources. It undermines uh, the rule of law and abets uh, crimes uh, such as the illicit trafficking of people, drugs, and arms. Tax evasion, money laundering, and other illicit flows uh, divert much needed resources for substantial development. The World Economic Forum estimates uh, the cost of corruption is at least 2.6 trillion US dollars or 5% of uh, global gross domestic product. And according to the World Bank, businesses and individuals pay uh, more than 1 trillion uh, in bribes each year. Corruption uh, begets more corruption and fosters a corrosive culture of impunity. The United uh, Nations Convention Against Corruption is, uh, well, a primary tool uh, to fight corruption. And uh, sustainable development goal of UN, it is uh, uh, goal number 16, targets also uh, this very phenomenon. Through the uh, Convention's peer review mechanism, we can work together to build a foundation of trust and accountability. We can endure the, and empower citizens, uh, promote transparency and strengthen international cooperation uh, to recover stolen assets. Millions of people around the world have gone uh, to the ballots uh, this year with corruption as one of their top priorities, our International Anti-Corruption Day. Let us make a stand for integrity. Full stop of the quote. Let me share with you uh, three myths about corruption, which may uh, sound very simplistic, but uh, need to be clearly understood. The first one. It wasn't me, it was uh, the other guy. That's wrong. Corruption involves uh, two parties, someone offering money and uh, someone else uh, accepting it. Both are guilty. The second one. Corruption is uh, a victimless crime. It's just a uh, lubricant uh, to grease the wheel. Uh, no, corruption erodes integrity, undermines trust, it is uh, hidden overhead cost and uh, can destroy uh, reputations. And the third notion is uh, there is nothing uh, that can be done about it. Uh, we hear it uh, quite often. It's a part of uh, doing business. Well, I believe this is wrong again. Uh, there is nothing inevitable about corruption. And uh, the Nordic countries uh, are the best example. Uh, there is nothing inevitable, I'd like to emphasize. And uh, the less it is tolerated, the more a culture of cheating will be replaced by a culture of integrity. And still, we need uh, to proceed from uh, a very strong uh, understanding uh, that 
uh, corruption is a crime. And uh, uh, let us take it uh, as it is. Uh, we have a responsibility to stop this crime. The bottom line is uh, corruption is the back uh, backyard of bad governance. And uh, while we are discussing uh, the uh, different uh, approaches and uh, different systems in which uh, certain countries can be successful or fail to, uh, uh, to uh, address uh, corruption effectively. But uh, the key issue is uh, that uh, this is a result of lack or absence of good governance. It, I can uh, just uh, decode this later on. Uh, to give an example, uh, corruption, uh, well, uh, even in Nordic countries, uh, there were certain instances of corruption, though, uh, though uh, the scale is, uh, well, uh, negligible and, uh, well, uh, I would uh, call it even a minuscule. But still, uh, well, certain cases are there, but the reaction is immediate and the reaction is very effective. So this is like garbage. Garbage, well, unfortunately, is everywhere. In every country, in every city, in every uh, village. But uh, the point is how effectively and quickly it is disposed. So, if uh, garbage is not cleared and uh, treated uh, in time, it pollutes uh, the environment and the health of people. Similarly, if corruption is not addressed in time, it cripples uh, the entire socioeconomic and political systems. Corruption has uh, long been recognized as a major threat uh, to national security and social and economic development globally. Numerous reports indicate how corruption adversely affects essential public services delivery, such as access to health care, education, or justice. Corruption crimes are recognized uh, as enablers of serious and transnational organized crime which generate huge profits and are the most important source of illegitimate uh, funds. According uh, to the International Monetary Fund, corruption exceeds 10 times the value of overseas development assistance. 10 times. And according uh, to the empirical studies, it is uh, the poor uh, who pay uh, the highest percentage of their income in bribes. We are witnessing today uh, how almost all crimes uh, cross borders and uh, jurisdictions in efforts uh, to disguise uh, the illicit nature of the funds. The negative impact of illegal financial transactions and flow of illicit money and other assets uh, derived from criminal activities across borders represent a priority challenge for societies today. Consequences are really very serious uh, and no need uh, to just mention them. I believe everyone understand, understands it uh, pretty clearly. Corruption represents uh, a major threat uh, to rule of law and sustainable development uh, the world over. And uh, quite simply, it is very bad for business. Recognizing the adverse uh, impact on global development and security, uh, the international community has uh, responded with a number of international instruments uh, to address uh, this challenge. Uh, one of them, the most effective and the most powerful, I mentioned, uh, and uh, there are some uh, other regional uh, documents uh, which uh, uh, can be also a good instrument. So a few words, uh, more words about uh, the UN Convention Against uh, Corruption. It requires uh, state parties uh, which ratified it uh, to undertake concrete actions that would enhance uh, the institutional and legal capacity in preventing and criminalizing the corruption in international cooperation and recovery of stolen assets. But this framework and uh, its provisions are not enough. Implementation needs uh, to be prioritized and backed up uh, by strong political will and resources. Of late, almost all governments and international organizations have made efforts uh, to address corruption, though to a widely divergent extent and uh, with different successes. It is a complex problem uh, which uh, requires a complex and multidimensional response. It is necessary also to proceed from the understanding that there are uh, different layers of corruption. If we uh, just uh, generalize uh, these levels, uh, uh, they are top, middle, and petty. 
Uh, and these uh, layers require, uh, require different approaches and uh, different solutions. For instance, the top layer corruption requires uh, good political governance, effective rule of law, freedom of the mass media and involvement of uh, civil society. Approaches uh, to petty corruption uh, might be uh, absolutely different. And there are instances when petty and middle uh, level corruption has, uh, have been successfully uh, coped with, but uh, the top level corruption uh, has remained uh, almost intact. Organizations uh, like UNODC, the World Bank, OECD have taken a lot of initiatives to counter corruption across uh, the globe. The top uh, priority is uh, that we must work together. The transnational nature of corruption and illicit financial flows means we need uh, multilateral cooperation and uh, we must strengthen good governance based on uh, the principles of transparency. And I'd like to once again mention all these principles which uh, can uh, make uh, a clue to uh, understanding how to combat this phenomenon. So the principles of transparency, accountability, responsibility, and awareness. And the capacities, of course, should be strengthening of national, regional, and international counter-corruption structures and institutions uh, to develop comprehensiveness in their activities. Communities and states uh, need to be joined uh, with the common purpose of uh, rejecting corrupt ideologies and stereotypes and uh, challenging those uh, who dispose uh, them. This means uh, governments adopting a comprehensive and inclusive approach involving all parts of society. This means effective separation of powers, effective rule of law, including independent and effective judiciary, and no less effective feedback and support from society. This also means uh, starting at the grassroots, where families and local communities are at the front line of efforts uh, to promote a culture of lawfulness and good governance. This also means increasing our support to civil society organizations who could make a unique and invaluable contribution uh, to tackling corruption and strengthening good governance. Ladies and gentlemen, since we have uh, representation from uh, uh, the BRICS countries at this conference, uh, I would like to mention that uh, uh, the BRICS member uh, states also uh, cited uh, the United Nations Convention Against Corruption as the basis on which to act. At uh, the 2015 UFA BRICS Summit, uh, the Anti-Corruption Working Group was uh, established uh, to uh, combat corruption. The five BRICS uh, nations uh, support uh, the strengthening of international cooperation against corruption, including through the BRICS Anti-Corruption Working Group, as well as on matters related to asset recovery and uh, uh, persons uh, thought for corruption. I believe uh, that uh, the following goals uh, should be pursued. Goal number one, developing a systematic, and I'd like to emphasize this, developing a systematic approach towards combating corruption. Corruption is a systematic phenomenon and only a counter system uh, can bring uh, a success which embodies uh, good governance, prevention, prosecution, adjudication and punishment, public awareness, and education involvement of the whole of society. The second goal is a renewed and sustained focus on preventing corruption. Over the past several years, uh, countries have made efforts uh, to achieve NCAC compliance, but corruption will not be defeated by legislative or law enforcement means alone. We need uh, to combine both counter and prevent. It is time to design and implement education-related measures and awareness-raising campaigns, uh, which emphasis, uh, with the emphasis uh, on the role of civil society organizations, academia, parliaments, uh, the media, youth, and the uh, general public in anti-corruption efforts. This goal uh, should be uh, to develop effective anti-corruption policies and tailor-made anti-corruption reform models to strengthen anti-corruption bodies and uh, overall framework, to promote the participation of individuals and uh, groups outside the public sector, such as civil society, in the prevention, 
corporate integrity, probity in public procurement, integrity of uh, the judiciary and uh, code of conduct for public officials all need to be promoted. I'm pleased uh, to share that UNODC uh, very recently signed a memorandum of understanding uh, with the Asian Football uh, Confederation uh, to fight sport-related crime. UNODC seeks to help protect integrity in sport by promoting uh, good governance in sport and mitigating uh, the risk of corruption that it faces. There is a whole variety of uh, root causes uh, of corruption. In uh, very simple terms, this boils down to need and greed. Corruption is widespread in some countries, uh, not because their people are different uh, from people elsewhere, but because conditions are ripe for it such as motivation to earn income is extremely strong. The second one, opportunities to engage in corruption are numerous. More regulations uh, uh, lead uh, to higher opportunities for corruption. Third, weak legislative and judicial systems. Fourth, law and the principles of ethics are poorly developed. Fifth, public perception of corruption is traditional <coughs> so to say, uh, and inevitable in problem solving. And uh, the last, but maybe uh, this is one of the most important, uh, political instability and weak uh, political will. Uh, I'll try to enumeration uh, the goals. So the third goal is uh, to develop effective prosecution and punishment. The fourth goal is uh, the need to integrate anti-corruption into uh, development assistance. The fifth goal is uh, to strengthen international cooperation to counter corruption and the role of the United Nations in assisting uh, to tackle corruption at different levels. So I mentioned uh, the unique role of uh, UNCAC, uh, but uh, uh, this is about uh, cooperation of different international institutions, including uh, the World Bank and uh, UNCAC, and uh, there are uh, multiple instances in this regard. And. Uh, uh, I'd like also to refer uh, to uh, two key projects uh, by UNODC. Uh, this is uh, uh, within the framework of our global program, Education for Justice. So this is also uh, a very uh, effective tool in addressing uh, the corruption phenomenon. Ladies and gentlemen, I also need uh, to mention one more uh, initiative by the World Bank and UNODC. This is uh, the uh, so-called STAR initiative, Stolen Assets Recovery. So this is really very important, very challenging, very difficult, but still it is going on and it brings in uh, certain cases very good positive results. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, let us uh, jointly develop uh, a culture of ethics, integrity, accountability, and control where governance is uh, good, fair, and clean. We need not only to promote uh, a fair criminal justice system, an independent judiciary, transparency in procedures, but promote and encourage fair competition. So fair competition in the private sector or among all the entities involved in economic activities is also a key uh, to addressing corruption. <coughs> And uh, uh, let me end uh, with the uh, statement that uh, UNODC stands ready uh, to, to as, uh, not only address but help in every way possible the governments of, uh, in this case, uh, South Asia uh, to address effectively uh, corruption. And uh, we have a special sub-program. So uh, uh, the regional office of UNODC for South Asia has developed a regional program for four years. And uh, combating corruption is a, a separate and very important uh, sub-program. So for four years we are involved and uh, we have uh, good activities uh, in, uh, so far, uh, they were in uh, Sri Lanka, in uh, Bangladesh, uh, Bhutan, but uh, in India, there were only a few workshops, but I do hope that uh, we can uh, succeed uh, in uh, finding, uh, well, financial support for our efforts because we have uh, very good and effective projects that can be successfully implemented. And uh, the only problem with India is uh, that uh, this is, well, a middle-income country which uh, has uh, a lot of uh, economic successes and many traditional donors of the UNODC uh, 
they opine that, uh, well, uh, their donor assistance uh, is of no need in this country. And it creates certain problems for international organizations, uh, including UN ODC. Thank you for your information. <laughs> Mr. Kapinos. Uh, I now request Ms. Wang Liu, Deputy Secretary General, Asian African Legal Consultative Organization and Counselor for Foreign Ministry of China to deliver her special address. Please, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, distinguished uh, founding Vice uh, Chancellor, uh, Professor Raj Kumar, and uh, Your Excellencies, Distinguished guests, friends, teachers, teachers, and uh, students. Uh, it is really a great uh, honor for me to attend this inaugural roundtable of the international conference, uh, which is uh, organized by the uh, OP Jindo Global University and Law School Global League. Uh, as informed to you, I am the Deputy Secretary General of the Asian African Legal Consultative Organization. Uh, for short, we call it ARCO. So this is our organization. The Secretariat is uh, 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 sit, uh, sit in Delhi. Uh, this organization uh, is composed of 47 member states. And all the member states are from Asian and African countries. And last uh, month, we just uh, celebrated our uh, uh, 62 uh, anniversary of funding. <coughs> so, uh, um, as the Deputy Secretary General of this uh, uh, organization of ARCO, and uh, also as the Counselor of Foreign Ministry of China, uh, I used to work in the law, uh, Treaty and the Law Department of the Forest, uh, Forest Service for two decades. So, uh, I have been working uh, in the field of international law for, for long. So uh, today, first of all, I wish to, uh, to thank the uh, conference organizers for inviting me to stress this important issue tonight on behalf of ARCO and also on behalf of uh, Chinese ambassador of the Chinese uh, embassy in, in, in Delhi. And uh, secondly, I wish to uh, extend warm congratulations on the opening of tonight's uh, event. Uh, now, uh, my uh, presentation will be two parts. The first part, I will, um, uh, I will uh, brief you the work of ARCO uh, uh, on this subject. And my second part, I would like to address the perspective of the Chinese government. So part one, ARCO's work, is this uh, international organization work. Uh, actually, uh, uh, International legal uh, uh, work uh, on this subject has been on our agenda for quite a long time. Uh, in January, uh, January 2001, the United Nations uh, General Assembly passed a uh, re uh, resolution uh, which is regarding the drafting of this convention. And at that time, it was an uh, article to get involved in the drafting of the convention. It was just at that stage of the development of the convention that ARCO played an important role with a view to striving for two objectives. First, to ensure that the convention, the convention uh, tonight uh, is uh, for short referred to the United Nations Convention against the corruption. So I just mentioned the convention, the convention. So firstly, to ensure that the convention is used by all ARCO member states as a valuable tool in their fight against the corruption within its borders. And secondly, to use the convention as an instrument for international cooperation so as to improve the collective capacity of ARCO member states to prevent corruption. It was during the same period that ARCO included the agenda item, an effective international legal instrument against corruption within its work program for its 41st annual session in 2002. 
ARCO allied its work with the ad hoc committee with the aim of voicing their views of the Asian, Asian and African states, majority of which were developing countries uh, grappling with the corruption problem. After holding seven sessions, the ad hoc committee completed the negotiation and the convention was opened for signature in December 2003 in Mexico. Out of 95 states to sign that day, 22 of them representing ARCO's member states. As an active participant in the ad hoc negotiation committee and the global forum on fighting corruption and safeguarding integrity, ARCO recognized that the convention is the most powerful weapon in the armory of international community in its fight against the corruption and um, embezzlement. ARCO has made all efforts to convince its member states to ratify the convention by placing the topic on, the, on its agenda at its annual session from 2002 to 2006. And thereafter, in 2010 and 2013, foisting uh, deliberations and discussions. Pursuant to the recommendations received from ARCO member states at its 43rd and 44th annual session. ARCO has annual session uh, annually, so every year, annual session. <coughs> so during annual session in 2005 and 2006, the ARCO, according to the recommendation from those two annual sessions, ARCO, ARCO secretaries prepared two special studies. The first one entitled Combating Corruption, a Legal Analysis, which was published in 2005, dealt with the theoretical underpinnings of corruption and the diverse legal uh, responses uh, from the member states at the individual, bilateral, and regional level. The second study, namely rights and obligations under the United Nations Convention Against Corruption, focused on the implementation mechanisms of the objectives in the convention, delving into key aspects of the convention. ARCO has also been instrumental in capacity, capacity building activities in relation to the legal response to combating corruption and spreading information in relation to the obligations and avenues for cooperation among its member states. In the past, ARCO had organized a seminar in collaboration with this Jindal Global University on the, sub, uh, the subject of that joint uh, organized uh, a seminar uh, 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 focused on corruption, eth uh, ethic, and good governance, which was uh, very well attended and had some thought-provoking presentations. ARCO continues its work on the convention and the fact that out of its 47 member states, 46 are the state parties to the convention against uh, corruption which is quite a high uh, percentage of the ratification. So that is the cause for satisfaction that, um, but still much work needs to be done in the future uh, in order to realize its aims and objectives, particularly in the areas such as asset recovery and the preventive measures. So my second part is uh, uh, China's perspective. Uh, uh, needless to say, China is one uh, member state of ARCO, and China supports all the efforts uh, that ARCO uh, has been uh, done uh, on this uh, convention uh, uh, in the negotiation process. But now I'd like to uh, present you the China's perspective uh, as the country itself, uh, uh, the, the involvement. China participated in the negotiations for drafting the convention between February 2002 and October 2003. China has participated in all the seven sessions. And China signed the convention on the very high level uh, political signing conference 
uh, 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 in December 2003. On October 27, 2005, the standing, the standing Committee of the National People's Congress of China ratified the convention. On January uh, 13, 2006, China submitted to the United Nations Secretary General the approval instrument and the governmental declaration, which expressed its intention to be bound by the convention. On February 12, 2006, China formally became a state party to the Convention Against uh, uh, Corruption. Since then, the Chinese government has been actively participated in all the sessions of the state parties' conferences and the related endeavors of intergovernmental working groups. China supports the objectives and spirit of fighting corruption presented in the Convention and implements the relevant measures and actions to fulfill China's commitment to combat uh, corruption in accordance with its national laws and policies as well as international treaties to which China is party. So far, the first uh, review period of the Convention's compliance inspection in China has been completed during which the Chinese government invited the member states to the convention to inspect China's compliance with the convention from 2010 to 2015. It indicated the seriousness and the firmness of the <coughs> Chinese government, government's efforts in faithfully implementing the convention. The second review period of compliance inspection in China will be carried out next year, in 2019. In order to effectively implement the convention, an interdepartmental coordination body consisting of 25 governmental units was established. Through this coordinated body, key issues related to the implementation of the convention are addressed and uh, interdepartmental uh, uh, inter efforts have been coordinated. Second, oh, actually the first part is the Chinese government lays great emphasis on the convention. This is the first part uh, for China's perspective. S uh, uh, second, China improves the uh, national legislation in connection with the implementation of the convention. In order to meet the needs of implementing the convention, new laws and regulations have been issued. Important uh, amendments have also been made to supplement the ex existing legislation, taking into account the provisions in the, pro in the conventions. Here are some important uh, uh, examples. In, 2000, in, in October 2006, the National People's Congress of China passed the anti-money anti -money laundering law of China, which entered into force on January 1, 2007. The law widens the definition of money laundering by including corruption and graft, and demanding that the financial and some non-financial institutions maintain customer and transaction records and report any large transactions believed to be suspect. The law drafted in accordance with the requirement of the Convention Against the Corruption also pledged to step up international coordination to combat global money laundering and exchanging information with overseas anti-money laundering organizations as well as another important development of Chinese legislation. In 2012, a chapter was amended into the criminal procedure law of China on procedures for conf confiscating illegal gains in cases where the criminal suspect or defendant has absconded or died, which provides legal basis for implementing the mechanism for recovery of property provided in the Convention. As the most recent evidence of China's uh, focus on 
and commitments on anti-corruption co enforcement. The National People's Congress of China passed an amendment to the Constitution Law of China, which is just uh, done this year, which established a new supervisory agency, the State Super Supervisory Committee, which combines the Central Commission for Di Di Disciplinary Inspection, the State Bureau of Corruption Prevention, the General Administration of Anti-Corruption of the Supreme People's Procuratorate and the Ministry of Supervision. The Chinese government believes that this will facilitate, that this will uh, facilitate an even stronger and more coordinated focus on anti-corruption enforcement. In addition to the laws and regulations, the Communist Party of China and the State Council of China have also issued quite a lot internal dis di disciplinary rules governing corruption and the bribery of the Communist Party's members and the governmental officials. To punish corruption, China enforces the rules and regulations with tough measures and zero zero tolerance. China has made it clear that anyone breaking rules and the laws will be dealt with and punished regardless of their positions. Third, strengthens the supervision through inspections. One of China's focus on fighting corruption is strengthening the supervision of the officials through inspections. In September 2007, the Chinese government established the National Bureau of Corruption Prevention of China in compliance with Article 4, Chapter 2 of the Convention, which says each state party shall, in accordance with its fundamental principles of legal system, ensure the existence of a body or bodies as appropriate which prevent corruption. The central authorities dispatches ins inspection teams to local authorities, governmental agencies, state-owned companies, and the governmental affiliated institutions. Their task is to inspect whether the policies and the rules of the central authority are faithfully implemented, particularly where there are violations of internal disciplines and rules, whether the selection of officials is rules-based, and whether there is any corruption. Inspections have, have become a powerful tool. Okay. Okay, then come to the first part. Engaging, engaging international anti-corruption uh, anti cooperation. China is a, member, is a member of 15 global and regional anti-corruption anti cooperation mechanisms. China serves as the chair of anti-corruption working groups of APEC and the G20s. China maintains close communications and cooperation with the United Nations Office and uh, UODC and the International Anti-Corruption Academy, Interpol, World Bank, OECD, and other organizations. China has um, anti-corruption anti cooperation with 89 countries and regions, concluded 44 extradition treaties, and 57 treaties on mutual legal assistance in criminal matters, and signed financial information exchange agreements with 35 countries. China has expect, uh, specifically carried out the following work to enhance international cooperation against the corruption. First, through extraditions, mutual legal assistance. Secondly, uh, uh, two, uh, strengthen information sharing. Three, negotiate and sign bilateral treaties on extradition and mutual legal assistance. Four, adopt diverse, uh, diversified approaches. Uh, by, international, by domestic legislation. Fifth, explore the potential through the existing international treaties. While 
By engaging international cooperation, China promotes the principles of mutual the principles of mutual respect, consultations on an equal footing, and the emphasis on effects, which means three important uh, uh, principles that China is promoting during during international cooperation against corruption. First one, uh, build up consensus on basis of uh, equality and trust. Second, take incremental steps to expand cooperation. Third, pursue win-win and result-oriented cooperation. Then, it is in the common interest of government and peoples around the world to deepen international anti-corruption cooperation in accordance with the principles of equality, mutual trust, incremental progress, mutual benefit, and result-oriented operation. China would like to strengthen practical cooperation with, with other countries. China would like to would like to strengthen mutual support and mutual assistance with other countries and need a close cooperation network which will benefit all the countries. To, to end my presentation, I wish this seminar all success and I wish you all have a wonderful evening. Thank you. And uh, I have, have my colleague, Mr. Xu uh, Yui, uh, has brought some brochure on our organization. I think uh, maybe some of you are interested to, in knowing more of uh, my organization. So please come to my colleague, Mr. Xu Joy. Thank you very much, Ms. Wang.